Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment of Life Sciences. I'm Yugen, and today with me, we're going to be focusing on biomes of South Africa. Now guys, it's important that we recognize that South Africa has a rich biodiversity. And that stems from the vastness of our rich biomes that we have. So when we talk of biomes, we need to understand the context of where we are. South Africa is a country that is surrounded with water around our coastal regions, but we've also got a large landmass. And so we have a combination of terrestrial biomes, those are the ones that are found on land, as well as the biomes along our coast. So in our lesson today, we're going to focus on both what biomes are, our terrestrial biomes, as well as the aquatic biomes. So let's get straight into having an overview of the concepts in our lesson before we move on to getting a detail of what the different biomes are. So as we wrap this lesson up, we're going to be looking at some terminology, essentially what a biome is and the different types of biomes. It's important that we review some important terminology, ecosystems. So guys, if you recollect, we've always looked at ecosystems from grade eight to nine. When we try and understand ecosystems, remember that a system refers to the interaction of different components. So ecology is a study of the, fa the environmental factors. When we look at ecosystems, we're looking at the interaction between the abiotic and the biotic components and how they are interdependent and interact closely. So essentially, we're looking at the living and the non-living components and how they interact with each other as well as the environment. And that's a, a field of study that's very significant in us in understanding our complexities around biodiversity. The abiotic factors that we refer to are the components that are non-living in the environment. So when we refer to our non-living components, we refer to them as the abiotic factors. And these influence how the environment is. It influences how organisms live in that specific biome. It's important to also recognize that we have living components, and those living components are called the biotic factors. And so we will spend some time looking at the biotic factors of each biome. So essentially the living components, which includes the plants and animals. Okay? So the term biosphere is essentially what we're going to unpack today. So the biosphere refers to, again, the sphere refers to a globe or kind of the earth that we live on, and the bio refers to the living components. So when we talk of biosphere, we refer to all parts of earth where humans and other organisms are able to live and interact with each other. As we get into the lesson and we unpack what biomes are and the different types of biomes, it's important that we recognize what a biome is. A biome is a large area with a certain climate, which is the abiotic components. Also, it refers to the specific kinds of plants and animals that are found typically in that area. So biomes are often distinguished by the type of plants and animals that are found in that area. A biome is usually made up of many ecosystems. So we have many ecosystems forming part of a biome. We also know that biomes can be either terrestrial or aquatic, as we would look at further in the lesson, as well as it's important that often biomes are named after a dominant vegetation. So when we talk of your terrestrial biomes, we look at the dominant vegetation in that area, and that is often used as a characteristic to identify a biome. When we look at aquatic biomes, we'll have to unpack the factor that we look at in terms of the nature of the water, in terms of the living components in there that defines the type of biome. Right. So when we look at biomes broadly, we can look at biomes as either being terrestrial or aquatic. And so these images essentially show you two terrestrial biomes. And these biomes essentially point to the complexities and as well as the varieties that we experience on land. So here's a grassland biome with a rich diversity of grasses and you've got um, your, your herbivores there. On the right hand side we've got a desert biome and typically seen where the temperature is extremely high, arid areas with very sparse vegetation. We'll obviously find a very different presence of living organisms in that area. So the type of organisms found are often influenced by the availability of food as well as the climate as well as the other abiotic factors. When we talk of the aquatic biosystems, we're going to unpack those in a little while. So these essentially refer to the biomes that are based on the availability of water in an area. 
And broadly speaking, aquatic biomes can either be freshwater biomes or your marine biomes. So by marine biomes, we refer to those biomes that are pre have presence of salt water or salty water, and your freshwater biomes are those that are found in your rivers, your dams, and your lakes. Okay, so as we get into the lesson, we've looked at some important terminology. We've tried to unpack what biomes are, and in our next segment, we spoke about the types of biomes. So broadly speaking, biomes are classified, again, according to the presence of land, in this case, the terrestrial, or the presence of these biomes in water. So broadly speaking, in South Africa, we have terrestrial biomes, and there are seven biomes that we're going to look at. And in terms of the aquatic biomes, we've got to recognize the aquatic biomes are based on either being the rivers, the lakes, the dams, which are your freshwater biomes, or your marine biomes, which would vary along the depth of the ocean. It would depend on the type of water that we see entering the seas. So as a wrap of the segment, guys, we've looked at some important terminology. We've tried to unpack what the definition of a biome is, and what is crucial in understanding a biome is understanding that it's dependent on the typical vegetation, the climatic conditions, and both the plant and the animal for life forms. As we move on to the next segment, we're going to be looking at the types of terrestrial biomes in South Africa. In this, we would have to spend time looking at the map of South Africa. But before we get into that, it's important that you have a little break and then freshen up. So I'll see you in a bit after a short break. Take care. See you now. Welcome back, life science learners, to the next segment of our lesson today. We've been focusing on biomes, and we've unpacked what different types of biomes are. In our segment now, we're going to be focusing on the terrestrial biomes of South Africa. As I mentioned, it's important that we recognize that the, the ter terrestrial biomes refer to the biomes that are found on land. Remember that South Africa is a, la is a country that is surrounded by water along our east and west coast. So those form the aquatic biomes. Let's now look at the biomes in South Africa, the terrestrial. As we study the terrestrial biomes, it's important that we have reference to the map of South Africa. And often learners struggle to remember where these biomes are because they remember the biomes but don't have context of the maps of South Africa and the different provinces. So, so as we get into this lesson, we're going to be focusing on the biomes, their locations, in the context of which provinces these are in. And I think it's important for you to recognize that. As we tackle each biome, we would look at the typical vegetation, the typical animals that are found, as well as the climate in those areas. So let's get straight into unpacking what the different terrestrial biomes are. Let's look at the map of South Africa and let's look at how it's divided into the seven different biomes. It's important that we first look at the key. And the key often is a color-coded area that gives you the locations of each of these biomes. In this map, all we need to look at is the geographical locations of these. So when we look at the, the forest biomes, and you can see sprinklings of this along the east coast of South Africa, so along this would be probably around Port Elizabeth and East London. If we go further up, we can see a little along the eastern parts of KwaZulu-Natal. We've got some of areas that are still rich as are regarded as forest. The next area are the is the Feinbos, and this is also known as the Cape Feinbos. And here, if you look along the ends of the Eastern Cape, sorry, the Western Cape here, and towards the southern parts of the Cape, you can see these dense areas of Feinbos. And remember that the Feinbos is areas that are typically having those plants that have extremely thin leaves that have adapted to the conditions there. The next area we're looking at is grasslands, and that forms a significant por par portion of central um, central parts of Gauteng, and you've got your, um, or your free state around here. Okay, Then you look at the Namakuru, and these would be predominantly the dry, arid areas of the Western Cape and the Central Cape here. Okay, And then predominant area of South Africa 
is the savannas, and the savannas are these areas that are in dark, and if you look at it, probably make up the largest areas of biomes in South Africa. And then we've got a very important biome called the succulent karoo, which serves as a significant area that attracts lots of tourists based on the types of plants that are present, both your succulent karoo as well as your Cape Bainbos. And then if we look at the last biome that we're going to view would be the thickets, and these are sprinkled along parts of, you can see KZN coming towards the eastern uh, Cape, and these are typically found as small scatterings around these areas. And that's often along the coastal regions and influenced by the type of climate that's present in these areas. So guys, that's just a quick overview of these biomes. Um, as we move on to, it's important that we recognize these biomes and learn where these biomes are. It's important that biomes are understood in the context of where they are. So as I mentioned, we've got the forest, the fainbos, the grasslands, the nama karoo, the savanna biomes, the succulent karoo, and your thicket. Let's look at the context of these in, 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 in terms of where we are in different provinces. So as we get into it, we looked at this is Pretoria, and we know that that's kind of the central capital. We've got Blomfontein here. We've looked at the, the, the Namibia and those areas that form the Namakuru. This is where your succulent Kuru, your succulent Feinbos, your succulent, sorry, your, uh, biomes where, and here you looked at the Cape Feinbos, and we so, said that larger portions of these areas made up your, your savannas. And then we saw sprinklings of thickets in these areas here. So let's look at both of these in comparison. And I think it's important that you're able to compare both and look at the geographical locations of these in there. So this is just purely for a, 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 a way in which you can identify the locations of these biomes in the context of where they are in the provinces. And often le learners learn the biomes, but don't understand where these are in the context of province. So, so try and use these images to try and understand where these biomes are in the context of the different provinces. Right. So as we look at each biome, it's important that we understand the location, the climate, the characteristic type of vegetation that defines that area, as well as the type of animals found in that. So these are the characteristics of each biome. So when we look at the savanna biome, the savanna biome, guys, if you look at it, is on my map is in red. So all these areas that are in the dark red are the savanna biomes. And these are predominant along the Mpumalung, Mpumalanga, as well as the Limpopo provinces. They are defined by hot, rainy summers. They have extremely cold or cold, cooler winters. The soil is infertile and porous, and water drains very quickly through them. The vegetation in these areas are characterized by baobab trees, acacia trees, and your marula. We also find typically the mopane worms found in these trees. If we talk of the characteristics of South Africa being identified by the big five, this is where you would find them. So your big five in terms of that's typically seen and associated with South Africa would be found in your savannah biomes. We also see it being home to the wildebeest, the eland, hippos, kudus, cheetahs, zebras, giraffes, wild dogs, and your hornbills. Right, so as you would see a beautiful image showing your baobab trees that are typically found in your savannas, You've got the big five here, which is essentially where they would be found. Um, you've got giraffes, you've got your amarula trees there, and you've got your acacia trees. And so these basically form what we refer to as your tourist hotspots, where tourists actually are attracted towards these because of the big game, and that we talk about the big five, as well as the, the presence of these typically unique animals found in these areas. So when we talk about uh, the Kruger National Park and the Pilansberg National Park, these are areas that are typically found in your savanna biomes. Right, so the next biome is the grassland biome. And if we go back to our chart, the grassland biome is typically seen in areas that are colored in yellow. Okay, so most of these are in the central plateaus of South Africa, the inland areas of KwaZulu-Natal, as well as the mountain areas along the eastern Cape province. So you'll see them along the eastern Cape province around that area there. The climate that is experienced in these biomes are hot summers with cold winters and often seen with frost. They have a high summer rainfall 
often with thunderstorms and hail. The soil has a rich upper layer, which is fertile. It's very conducive for farming, especially of maize, as well as for cattle feeding. It's also known as the soot grass, and it's actually the sweet grass, and that is the vegetation that's typically uh, enjoyed by your antelopes, your blessbok, your elant, your springbok, as well as, as well as your wildebeest. So some of these images you can see here, you kind of got your wildebeest. You've got these plantations of maize that are grown extensively because of the rich soil that's present there. And you've got the grass that the elans feed on, which is also kind of the sweet grass that's typically found in areas that attract these animals. The next biome is the Namakuru, and the Namakuru in this map is used and indicated in the scale of using the color brown. And the Namakuru covers most of the central plateau regions of the western and the northern Cape provinces. So if you look at it, the western and the northern Cape provinces are in those areas there. Okay, It's a semi-desert, flat and rugged terrain. The ground is dry and rocky. Um, there's no permanent uh, you know, flowing rivers in there. These often dry up. The rainfall is less than 500 millimeters in a year, which is often experienced in drought. The summers have extremely high temperatures and winters can be extremely cold. So the soil is sandy with very little nutrition and often is ideal for uh, animal farming. So here you've got plants that are typically adapted to these extremely dry conditions. You have a stone plant, which is typically seen in that. You've got the sweet thorn and you've got the karoo daisies. In these areas, because of this, the, the nature of the temperature, you find that the animals are much smaller. So you've got a variety of rodents. You've got fox, jackal. You've got ostriches. You've got many reptiles. And you've got some endemic scatters of larks. Okay, so here you can see the typical terrain, dry, rocky. You've got uh, plants that are typically adapted to dry conditions. These are the karoo daisies that we're talking about. You've got your jackals and a unique plant called the rock plants. And these are plants that, if you look at them, have got shriveled leaves, extremely small. They've got stems that have really become thickened to absorb water and be able to withstand the dry, harsh conditions. Their flowers are adapted to be able to be very small to attract insects for pollination. So usually not noticed in the rocky terrain, but these are plants that blossom and produce these beautiful flowers that often emerge from what seems to be rocks. The next biome we're looking at is the succulent crew. So if we unpack the word succulent, it often refers to plants that have thick, fleshy leaves. And so this is an area that is found along the western coast of South Africa. So in the map, it's the blue areas that are shaded out. So this is the west of the western escarpment through the western belt of the western Cape. So as I indicated here, it's along this area. It's and inlets towards the Little Karoo. So you'll find that it's towards the Little Karoo down there. They have winter rainfall. They're very hot and dry summers. The soil is sandy with very little nutritional value. It often has plants that are succulent plants that are plants that have thick fleshy leaves um, it's often seen as defined by the Namaqualand daisies, and you have your annual plants. This is often a, a tourist hotspot in terms of people going to view these Namaqualand daisies when they blossom during the summer and the spring. Okay, it's characterized by the Dasi, the Namaqua, dune mole rats, as well as a barking gecko. Okay, and here you can see these geckos that actually produce a, a sound that resembles that of a dog. They tend to call out and chirp a bit, okay? And these are the amazing, beautiful flowers that spring up during the spring, okay? So if you've, if you've had the opportunity to visit these areas, beautiful during spring, lush, for, lush areas covered with beautiful flowers for as far as your eyes can see. So again, important biome from, from a tourist perspective. The next is the Feinbos. And what is unique about the Feinbos is often remind the learners that it's, it's, it's regarded as an ecological hotspot. And what do we mean by that? It's an area that is host and home to many endemic species that are found exclusively in South Africa. And these are often threatened by human activity. So the Feinbos, again, is a recognized as a hotspot which has some of the most endemic plants found in South Africa. And these are often need to be 
cared for and conserved because of human threat in that environment. So if we look at the Feinbos, the Feinbos is this area that's indicated here along the western and towards the southern parts of the Cape. So it's the southern and the southern southwestern parts of the Cape province. The climate that is experienced here is that the winters are cold, the summers are hot and dry, the soil is infertile, and it's leached all of all its nutrients. This will limit the growth of large plants, and hence you'll find that the plants that are found in these areas are often plants that have extremely, that are very reduced in their ability to grow high or tall, they've reduced leaves, and typically found in these areas because of the type of soil that has actually been leached out of all its nutrients, okay? 68% of the plants found in these areas are endemic, and as I mentioned, the word endemic refers to plants that are found only in that part of the area, nowhere else in the world. So a rich, biodiverse spot. It's one of the six floral kingdoms in the world where protea, shrubs, the rooibos plants, olives, table vines, and your attaching reeds are found. It's also characterized by the clipspringer, the Cape Mountain zebras, the geometric tortoise, and baboons. And so I've got images of them. So these are your, so you have a beautiful view of the Table Mountain. And at the foot of that, you can see your, your Feinbos plants all in these areas here. Okay. Also, the geometric tortoise typically found in these areas endemic to the Cape Feinbos. Okay. As we wrap this section up, we're looking at the forest biomes. Again, the forest biomes are indicated in these areas here in green. And so that's little bits of them around your Cape coastline along the southern coast, as well as along Naisna and Titsikama. They have rainfall throughout the year, mainly winter. It's obviously very coastal. Uh, the forests are cool and moist, and it's often very humid, and the soil is deep and very fertile. So we have plants that are found at the Otenigua yellowwood trees. You've got epiphytes, ferns, and your vines. So again, Forests are typically areas that are much cooler and, and have lots of humidity. So these plants are adapted to being able to live in the cool, shady areas of these forests. Animals that are found in these are the blue dacres, your bush pigs, your nisner, lorries, your woodpeckers, as well as your paradise eye catchers. Okay, so these are the typical ones that we're looking at. So you can see these ferns that grow in the much in the cooler parts of the forest. And there's your dussies and your wa warthogs. Okay. And finally, as we wrap this section up, the thicket biome, again, these are patches that are found along the eastern coasts of South Africa. So along the east coast of KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape, here the rainfall is fairly high. There are areas that are covered with sandy dunes, and they have soil that's often very clay. There are different types of plants. They're often shrubs, evergreen forest succulents that are found. Typically found along these areas are monkeys, squirrels, elephants, as well as your black rhinos. And so as we look at these, these are your succulent plants, and often you find lots of aloes, you find your euphorbia species, which are the thickets and aloes that are growing in these areas, and they're often home to monkeys that have enjoyed the type of vegetation and the flowers and the fruits in these areas. So guys, we've looked at the seven terrestrial biomes, and remember that it's important that we recognize their location, the typical climate that's experienced, and that's defined by the rainfall, the temperatures during summer, winter, and other unique features of the soil. We then spent some time looking at the characteristic animals of each one. And then we looked at the types of plants that are found. And essentially that defines what a biome is. An area that is characterized by its climate, its its, but the vegetation and the types of animals that inhabit that area. You've been great. Let's have a short break and I'll see you at the end of that. <music> Welcome back, life science learners. We've been looking at biomes. In the previous segments, we've looked at terrestrial biomes. In our segment now, we're going to look at aquatic biomes. Before we get into aquatic biomes, it's important that we recognize that the terrestrial biomes referred predominantly to all the biomes that are found on land. As we unpack the aquatic biomes, we're going to be looking at the types of aquatic biomes and try and get a sense of where these are. So 
So let's get straight into understanding what are aquatic biomes. So guys, when we look at the aquatic biomes in South Africa, we've got to recognize we have freshwater biomes and marine water biomes. So what is it that we mean by when we refer to a freshwater biome? So think of all those water bodies that do not have salt, okay? And if we talk about the marine biomes, we're referring to essentially those biomes that have a presence of salt in the water. So your marine biomes are much larger in terms of areas and they have a large salt content when compared to your freshwater biomes. South Africa has, the, has a long coastline which stretches to over 3,000 kilometers in, along the east coast, the southern parts, as well as the western coast. This long shoreline allowed for the development of many types of marine ecosystems. So we're going to look at these biomes from trying to understand this. So when we look at South Africa, we can see that you've got a predominantly coastal area that covers over 3,000 kilometers. And so we've got the Atlantic Ocean along the western coast, we've got the Indian Ocean along the, the eastern coast. And so these typical coasts have different types of water that enters in these areas. And so we're going to look at that in a little while. When we look at the aquatic biomes, it's important that we look at the abiotic factors and how these have an effect on the kinds of plants and animals and communities that are found along these coastlines. So what influences these would be the ocean currents, the amounts of oxygen and salt in the water, the tides that are experienced, as well as the temperature changes. And so all of these factors influence the types of plants as well as marine organisms found in those areas. So as we saw in our terrestrial biomes, we looked at the effect of temperature and the climate when we're looking at our aquatic biomes, we've got to look at these factors, the ocean currents, the amount of oxygen, the effect of tides, as well as temperature changes in the water. Okay, so as we stand back and reflect on the types of oceans that we have, as I mentioned, along the east coast, we've got the Atlantic, uh, sorry, on the western coast, we've got the Atlantic Ocean. Along the Indian Ocean, on the east coast, we've got the warm Benguela current. And this is the water that comes down from the equatorial uh, north area into the southern parts, and that brings in warm water that goes towards the southern tip of South Africa. We also have along the west coast, we've got the cold Benguela current, and this is water that comes in from the Antarctic, which is extremely cold, and that brings in, and in this area, we've got the cooler waters along the western coast, and we've got the warmer waters along the eastern coast. And this unique difference in temperature also creates certain microclimates or areas which have typical plants and animals or aquatic plants and aquatic animals that inhabit these areas. So as I mentioned, we can broadly divide these into the freshwater biomes and your marine biomes. The freshwater biomes are divided into three different types. These are your dams and lakes, rivers, along with your wetlands. So in terms of us understanding where fresh water is found, dams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands are often identified as areas that have fresh water, water that we can consume in terms of that is not salty. And these have typical types of temperatures as well as a pH of water, as well as the type of temperature that's found in the area that influences the temperature of the water. When we look at aquatic biomes that are the marine, these are divided into your sandy shores, your rocky shores, your coral reefs, your mangrove swamps, estuaries, as well as your oceans and your open seas. And guys, when we try and unpack these, we're gonna to have to look at, again, the typical type of microorganisms or aquatic organisms that live there and, and how that is influenced by the terrain or the area. Right, so as we wrap this, we've looked at South Africa's seven terrestrial biomes we're now going to spend some time looking at each aquatic biome in detail and try to understand what this looks like and how it constitutes the types of plants and animals found in these aquatic environments. You've been a good audience for a short while. Let's have a break and I'll see you back in a bit.
Welcome back, Life Science Learners, to our final installment. In our lessons today, we've been focusing on biomes with a special focus on the terrestrial and the aquatic biomes. We've looked at what the characteristics of biomes are, and we said that biomes are characterized by the climate, the environmental conditions, which include both the temperature, the rainfall, as well as it's identified or defined by the typical plant and animals found. And so biomes create these areas that are distinguishable. When we look at the aquatic biomes, we're going to have to unpack that based on the temperature of the water, the type of organisms that inhabit these areas. So let's get straight into looking at aquatic biomes along the South African coast. So when we first look at biomes, we're going to unpack what the marine biomes are. And the biome that we're looking at are your sandy shores. And so this image shows you the beach where there's predominant sand along the coastal areas with very little vegetation. Again, the type of soil that is found in your sandy shores does not support the growth of plants. So think of what soil has. So soil has a mixture of different sand particles. So when we talk of your sandy shores, it has predominantly large particles or grains in which many of the, many of the plants that are adapted to living require an, in a deep root system. So these soil particles are, have a poor of our, have a poor water retention capacity and so the water drains through. So you'll find that there's very little vegetation that on these shores and often because of a lack of vegetation, guys, you'll find that most of your, your aquatic organisms are found in the water with very little living organisms along the coastal regions. And here you can see some, some sparse vegetation that's found on these sandy shores. It's a constantly changing environment, and that's depending on the tides that are present. And so because they are found on these sandy shores, you'll find that when the high tide comes in and the low tide moves out, it often affects the, the type and the shoreline. So this would be a constantly changing environment and often not conducive for plants to actually grow along that coastal area. And what I said was that there are very few animals that are found along these coastal regions. It's obviously a paradise for people in terms of using their 4x4 four four vehicles. And we'll talk about the effect that humans have had on these sandy shores. And so because of these open areas, we find that humans have, in some areas have used these shores for 4x4 four four off-riding. And that has often affected the type of the shoreline. And in many cases, even some of the animals or organisms that live. So remember that although we're seeing a sandy shore, but in that you've got some marine invertebrates that live, so your crabs that live in here. So driving your 4x4 four four vehicles on this often affects the landscape and the env and animals that live there. Okay, so we also get rocky shores as the next biome. And so, so the term rocky is typical of the type of rocks that are found. And so if you look at these images, you can see that the shoreline is covered with rocks. And what is unique about these shorelines is that these rocks create little tidal pools that are filled with marine organisms. We often find that on these rocks you find clams and mussels clinging along. And so these are often areas that are rich in pools filled with marine invertebrates. So they form a firm foundation for plants and animals um, to live on. These areas show a great diversity of living organisms. So you find, you'll find a lot of algae, you'll find lots of seaweed in these little areas. But they also form these little tidal pools as the tide recedes, you'll find that water tends to accumulate in these rock pools. And within them, I know that many of you would have went and kind of tried to find when you go to the beach to try and look at into these rock pools to look at the type of fish and even some of your marine invertebrates. And so that's what we're going to look at. So you'll find that certain, they create rock pools and in these there's a rich diversity of marine life. And these include your clams, your mussels, crabs and often are found on these rocks. So you'll find that often in the crevices between these rocks, you'll find that crabs often live. As I mentioned, you've got these clams and that are obviously found in the intertidal zone. So when the tide comes in, these are covered. When the tide flows becomes low, you'll find that these fill up with water and form these little rock pools in which you find a diversity of marine organisms. The next biome we're looking at is your ocean ecosystems. And guys, these refer to your open ecosystems, your open ocean ecosystems. And so a beautiful image showing you the diversity of coral and the diversity of your fish 
and your larger and your smaller fish in these areas. So these are often very large marine bodies that cover most of the Earth's surface and contain the largest of the ecosystems. So most of our areas away from the shorelines form part of your deep ocean systems. The open ocean or the seas contains a rich diversity of living organisms, and these include your invertebrates as well as your vertebrates. By that I mean you're looking at your phytoplankton, your zooplankton, as well as your larger mammals, so your sharks, your, 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 your dolphins, your whales, as well as some of the larger fish like the sharks. Okay, so not many plants actually are found at the bottom. You'll find lots of seaweed, and that's because of a lack of light penetrating into the deeper parts of the ocean. So you'll find that towards the upper surfaces, you'll find a layer of, of seaweed that grows, but as you go further down, there'll be a lack of plant material growing there, and that's due to the absence of light. So algae called phytoplankton will form a major part of these ecosystems, and phytoplankton are responsible for the production of oxygen on Earth. And so they are able to photosynthesize and make the oxygen, which obviously contributes significantly to the oxygen on the surface of the Earth. So these have much cooler temperatures in the water, and that's because of very little light penetrating to the bottom. The water is much warmer on the surface, and so you'll find there's a different distribution of life forms in these ocean bodies. Okay, so animals vary from being microscopic, and here you can see your, your zooplankton, and you've got your phytoplankton there, and these are often very small to extremely large, and you can see you've got your large fishes and shark and whale that are found. Examples of animals in these oceans may include the different types of fish, whales, sharks, octopuses, perlamun, crabs, and your crayfish. So when we talk about the diversity of life forms in ocean, I mean, the best part to actually look at the diversity would be in your deep ocean ecosystems. Okay. We also have the next biome is your coral reefs. And so guys, when we look at invertebrates, your marine invertebrates, corals form a significant part of that. So we would have heard of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. We also have a coral reef along the east coast of South Africa. So you'll find that these coral reefs are found in the warmer, the clear, shallow waters of the, trop of the tropical oceans and around islands and along the continental coastlines. And, and these typically are where the water is much warmer, and that's because of the influence of the warm Benguela current along the east coast. You'll find that coral reefs are mostly formed underwater from the calcium carbonate produced by living coral. Coral reefs provide food and shelter for many other organisms and protect the shoreline from erosion. So these coral reefs form an important part of actually a barrier that that's breaks some of the heavy waves that, 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 shore, that reach the shore. And so they're seen as an important part of the ecosystem in terms of maintaining the shoreline. And so the destruction of these coral reefs due to pollution, due to oil spills, has a significant effect on other marine organisms. As I said, coral reefs form these little homes to other invertebrates. And I mean, you would have seen many little documentaries where you see fish, a diversity of life forms found in these. And these typically feed and are protected by the heavy currents when the currents change, and they're able to seek shelter in these coral reefs. Okay, South Africa has only one coral reef, and that's in the subtropical ocean waters of the Lake St. Lucia, along the northern KwaZulu-Natal. So if you've been towards KwaZulu-Natal along the northern coast, you find that there's an estuary along St. Lucia, but you also find further along the shoreline, you'll find that there is a coral reef which is unique to South Africa. So this is an image that shows you the typical corals, and you can see that these are, are fish that have actually created these microhabitats in which they feed and find food in. Okay. We also know that estuaries are an important part of the biomes. And so estuaries refer to those water bodies that connect the freshwater ecosystems or biomes to your marine water biomes. So this image shows you the typical shoreline, but it shows you the river that meets the sea. So you've got different points along South Africa's uh, coastal regions where many of the rivers move into the seas. And so we refer to those as estuaries. So an estuary is partially enclosed coastal body of brackish salty water, which one or more rivers and streams flow into. 
and with these there is a free there is a free connection to the open sea so so you find that rivers often tend to lagoon into the ocean and they create these little areas that are separated as you notice here these areas are slightly isolated from the sea so you find that when the tides change the water moves in and when the tides recede the water moves out and so these create a unique habitat for animals and plants that are typically suited to that brackish water slightly salty but not as intense as the open oceans so estuaries form a transition zone between the river environments and your marine environments. And these are unique in that they support a diversity of plants and animals that are unique to, uniquely found there. They contain a lot of nutrients in silt that is washed down the rivers, meaning that they can support a diversity of plants and animals. So what's unique about these estuaries is that during floods and rains, you find that the silt on the top fertile soil is washed into these rivers that carry them towards the open seas and so as they tend to accumulate here you find that these become uh, a site that is rich in topsoil and so that supports a diversity of plants and, and that live along these areas and hence we see the development of mangroves that have a rich diversity along these estuaries then we get to freshwater biomes and these are divided into dams lakes rivers and wetlands guys it's important that we recognize freshwater biomes are probably a smaller part of the aquatic biomes but they are a crucial part of our existence and survival because we do rely on the freshwater systems for the access to drinking water so when we look at freshwater ecosystems or biomes remember that these are the, the only sources of fresh water that we have in terms of water that we can make potable or drinkable so let's remember that when we talk about these freshwater biomes so dams and lakes form an, a crucial part and throughout South Africa we see the development of dams and many lakes that have formed over the years. We also know that South Africa is a rich tributary of rivers that connect and interconnect and move down into our coastal regions. We see sprinklings of wetlands along our coastal regions and one such wetland is the St. Lucia wetland which we will look at and its importance. And so wetlands play an important part in terms of the conservation of water. So during the rain, these wetlands soak up the excess water and that water then gets into the table, the water table, and allows for that water to be retained and used by the, the plants in that environment. So let's look at wetlands. A wetland is a place where the land is covered by water, either salt, fresh, or somewhere in between. And so wetlands are often found in areas between where the water collects and often it's seen sometimes as a transition zone between the sea and the ocean. Marshes and ponds develop the edges of the lakes or oceans. You'll find the delta of the mouth of a river or low-lying areas that are frequently flooded. All of these are wetlands. So if you think about areas in your community or areas where you find that when it rains, it becomes swampy, those are wetlands. If you think of areas along the mouth of a river, so where a river meets the ocean, we often have wetlands in there. So as I mentioned, Wetlands are often seen as the sponges in earth, where the water, after a rain, soaks up into the soil. And that water is stored and it flows back into the table where we can then access water from the water table. And so they form an important part in terms of maintaining the, the, the fresh water ecosystems that we have. So here's an image of our fresh, wa and the fresh, wet, fresh water systems, and this is a wetland, and you can see a dense uh, plantation as well as the lilies on the surface of these waters. Uh, one typical water, uh, wetland that we need to look at is the St. Lucia wetlands. And it's important that we understand why wetlands are important. So again, wetlands are important because they support a rich biodiversity of birds, plants, as well as animals. So in this you'll find, you get certain plants that are typically found, the bulrush, the arum lilies, the red hot pokers. There's a large amount of recycling of nutrients that occur in these wetlands, where you'll find that there is the, the nutrients that run off the rivers and the soil collects in these wetlands and become a rich source of nutrients to the rest of the areas along these uh, wetlands. So there's, um, they're important in moderating the global climate temperatures and changes. The important storage of role in preventing floods 
and they retain large volumes of water during rainy seasons and they release them during the drought. So as I mentioned, that these, these are areas that suck up and soak up the water when we have floods. And, and when the rains have stopped, the water from these wetlands then filter in and serve as a source of water to the surrounding areas. Okay, So they also play an important role in filtering pollutants out of the water and recycling them in the soil. So as they collect the runoff water, these wetlands will actually soak up the soil, soak up the water into the soil and help filter some of the pollutants. And some of the pollutants are degraded in that and return back to normal. And so they form an important area in terms of filtering your pollutants. So why are wetlands important? If we look at the wetlands in the St. Lucia, it has been recognized as South Africa's first World Heritage Site. And this is seen as an important milestone in terms of us understanding the importance of wetlands. So wetlands are important for ecotourism. I recently had the opportunity of being able to go to St. Lucia. And it's an area that is vast in terms of the unique types of plants and animals that are found there. If you wanted to see hippos, you'd have to go to a wetland. And so one such wetland is the St. Lucia estuaries. And so here you find that ecotourism generally focuses on an unadulterated, pristine natural environment. So these are areas that haven't been contaminated. So the wetlands form a huge attraction for tourists to be able to come and watch your, your hippos, as well as bird watching. And so it forms an important part. It is also an important part of our cultural environments and creates awareness around our environments. It encourages a positive experience for visitors as well as hosts. So you'll find that ecotourism often is an important part of, of South Africa's economy. So guys, as we wrap this up, we've looked at biomes, we've looked at terrestrial biomes, we've looked at aquatic biomes, and we've looked at finally the significance of these biomes. And fundamentally, it's important that we're able to conserve these biomes so that they form an important part of our ecological footprint in terms of the way we can experience these on a daily basis. You guys have been a great audience. I wish you well. Have a bye like a day and see you soon.